For what purpose does the gentleman from Louisiana seek recognition? Uh, Mr. Speaker, thank you for uh, recognizing a uh, motion to speak out of order for the purpose of inquiring to the majority leader the schedule for next week. Without objection, the gentleman is recognized. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Also ask unanimous consent to revise and extend remarks. Without objection. With that, I'm happy to yield to my friend, the gentleman from Maryland, the majority leader, Mr. Hoyer. I thank the gentleman from Louisiana for yielding. Uh, Mr. Speaker, on Monday, the House will meet at 12 p.m. for morning hour and 2 p.m. for legislative business and votes postponed until 6.30 p.m. On Tuesday and Wednesday, the House will meet at 10 a.m. for morning hour and 12 p.m. for legislative business. On Thursday, the House will meet at 9 a.m. for legislative business. Next week, Mr. Speaker, the House will consider S-1098, the Joint Consolidation Loan Separation Act, bipartisan legislation uh, sponsored by Representative David Price and Senator Mark Warner to provide relief to borrowers who need to separate their joint consolidation student loans. This legislation would greatly benefit the individual borrowers who are most in need of relief, including victims of abuse. The House may also consider a continuing resolution. As all of us know, on September 30th at uh, midnight, the government's ability uh, to fund and operate uh, goes out of authorization. Therefore, it's necessary for us to take action before September 30th, and we may do that next week. The House may also consider legislation to reform the Electoral Count Act from Representatives Zoe Lofgren and Liz Cheney. The House will consider bills under suspension of the rules. The complete list of suspension bills will be announced by the close of business tomorrow. And as is usual, as we come very close to ending a very substantial and then have a substantial period of time, October and the first uh, week in November, for the or first and second week for the election, uh, it is common that we may have other pieces of legislation, Mr. Speaker, uh, available uh, and necessary to pass. And we will notify uh, members as soon as we have that information. And I thank the gentleman for yielding and yield back. I thank the gentleman. As it relates to the continuing resolution, uh, I know the gentleman said may come up. Uh, we haven't had any details that have been shown to us on what that might look like in terms of other items in addition to uh, some kind of short term or even what the duration of a short term would be. So if, if there are any uh, dates that y'all have already started thinking about that would be included in a continuing resolution, any extraneous items. There's some other funding that's been thrown about. Uh, there's been talk that uh, Senator Manchin, there may be some agreement that uh, Senator Manchin would have some kind of permitting reform. Not sure if that would be part of a continuing resolution or a standalone bill. If the gentleman could provide any clarification on any of those items, uh, that, that we haven't been privy to in the conversations, and I'd yield. Thank the gentleman. That's a obviously, uh, obviously good question and good thing to have. Uh, the appropriators are working through the administration's list of anomalies, uh, which I know uh, there are three or four items dealing with health, also dealing with Ukraine, and a couple of other matters. I don't have that list in front of me, but uh, the answer to your question is they are trying to get that together. Uh, and I think they're pretty close. Uh, I will talk to uh, the chair, Chair DeLauro. Uh, I presume she's in conversation with and discussions with the ranking member uh, as well, but I'm well sure that that's the case. Uh, there's also, I, I believe, money also being asked for disaster relief uh, that may well be in the CR. The gentleman referred to the uh, discussions that occurred in the Senate uh, between uh, Mr. Manchin and uh, Majority Leader Schumer, Senator uh, Manchin, and obviously uh, we're going to see what the Senate does. I don't know what the Senate is going to do. Uh, it's one of the reasons uh, there has been a discussion about the Senate moving first on that. I've had discussions with the senator about the, when they were going to move, and uh, I think that's under under discussion. I thank the gentleman, and obviously we will be staying to, in touch on that. Hopefully, uh, Ms. Lofgren will uh, have some conversations with Ms. Granger about 
details because we haven't seen those yet. We surely okay. would like I, to I be more involved in those discussions. Uh, if I might add, I, I want to make uh, just you are aware, and I know you are, but I want to make the members aware that uh, we will need to be here for such times as it takes us to pass the continuing resolution so that government will continue to operate essential for the economy, essential for our national security, uh, essential for the employees, but also essential for all those that they serve on a daily basis. So uh, I've, I've uh, told my members there's some discussion about what are we going to do the last week uh, in September, uh, and I've told my members and would, would also make clear to all of our members, including the members on your side of the aisle, that they uh, ought to be making sure that uh, the last three days uh, of November weekdays and that Saturday they ought to keep clear so that if, in fact, we need to uh, work during those period of times, and my expectation is we're going to have to, that they not be uh, uh, canceling events that they scheduled. Just so to being on notice, I think, will be fair to them and fair to anybody that we're scheduling with. I yield back. And thank the gentleman. And as we are more in the first half of September, obviously this would all be at the very end of September. Hopefully we wouldn't wait till the midnight hour. We're well aware of the deadline. Hopefully we can get something brought, ideally agreed upon by both sides, which we're nowhere near right now, but at least to have more direct conversations well in advance of the deadline so we're not here watching the clock strike midnight wondering if, if we get gentlemen, you, I could not agree with the gentleman more. Uh, I think I'm probably as frustrated, I know the members of the Appropriations Committee, as frustrated as anybody in this institution. As someone who served on the committee for 23 years, on the Appropriations Committee for 23 years, uh, we ought to be passing bills in a timely fashion. We ought to be passing them one at a time. We ought not to have these gigantic omnibuses that nobody knows about. Both sides have had to uh, repair two omnibuses at the end of the year to fund government because we haven't passed uh, individual appropriation bills in a timely fashion, either through the House or the Senate, or through the House and the Senate to the President. So I, I, I agree with the gentleman entirely. And I agree also that we ought to give you, everybody, as much notice as we possibly can <clears throat> I will tell the gentleman, frankly, I was hopeful that we would have passed the CR this, this week for reasons that are, I think, obvious to everybody that we haven't done that. But uh, I'm hopeful that we can do it sooner rather than later and don't have some uh, September 30th crisis that we seem to always create. I thank the gentleman for yielding. And thank the gentleman. Now, hopefully we can start seeing actual language and text next week. Uh, so we can either get to a place where we're in agreement or try to resolve those areas of disagreement. Um, as the gentleman was talking about the calendar and other items that may be coming up, I noticed there were no conversations about any of the legislation that we've been talking about bringing to the floor to address uh, inflation. We just saw uh, Tuesday, um, as the president's holding a party at the White House to celebrate inflation, we saw yet again uh, more devastating news on the inflation front to the point where the markets tanked during that party at the White House. We have a package of bills that would help bring down inflation, bring down energy costs, uh, help those families who are struggling as we get ready to face another cold winter. Uh, and there's expectations right now by all the experts that energy costs will go up again because we have limited supply here in the country. Uh, as we identify those bills uh, and yet not see any of them being listed for debate on the House floor. Can we try to get some kind of direction of will this majority work with us to bring bills to the floor to address these real problems that are hurting families all across the country? And I would yield. I thank the gentleman. I obviously anticipated that uh, question. Thought about it. And I want to say to the members uh, my thoughts that I frankly talk about all over the country. We passed a number of bills. Uh, inflation is hurting our people. 
Inflation was not caused by President Biden or this Congress. Inflation was caused by the pandemic. Inflation uh, hurt businesses severely, hurt employees severely. In a bipartisan way, we voted uh, as that pandemic uh, started, and we saw the broad impacts of that. Uh, we, in a bipartisan fashion, stepped in uh, to help. It made a very, very big difference. I start that way because the representation of some is that somehow we, by passing legislation, have caused this inflation. The OECD nations were the, were the economic developed countries of the world, have all had inflation. As a matter of fact, the average OECD nation has had a 10.2 percent inflation rate. As the gentleman knows, ours is 8.3 percent. Mexico's didn't have any of the bills that we passed, had an 8.7 uh, inflation rate. The Netherlands, that didn't have uh, an American rescue plan, uh, has a 13.6 percent inflation. Sweden, small, very successful country, didn't have an American rescue plan and has a inflation rate of 9.8 percent. Austria, another strong, strong economic country, 9.3 percent. Denmark, the country of my father's birth, 8.9 percent. Uh, and you say, so what? The so what is that we have seen a global inflation. I haven't mentioned uh, some of the other uh, countries in, the, in Asia who have had inflation rates as well. But simply to say that uh, both parties, all members, understand the consequences and pain of inflation uh, at the pump. The gentleman, in, in some of the discussions we've had, has pointed out prices have gone up. I have not heard him say that uh, uh, the president's taken certain action and it's come down uh, about uh, 35 percent plus uh, over the last uh, six, uh, seven weeks, uh, from 502 as an average down to somewhere in the 3.6. Is that low enough? It is not. It's been much higher. It was higher in 2008, in 2008, under George Bush. But it needs to come down further. We can continue to work on that. And we passed a number of pieces of legislation. I mentioned the American Rescue Plan. It took 48 percent of America's children out of poverty, that were in poverty. Not, not 48 percent of America's children, but 48 percent of American children that were in poverty were taken out by the American Rescue Plan. Uh, none of us are wearing masks on this floor or essentially around the country. And we gather together, we get in rooms close to one another. Why? Because we got 250 million shots in arms. We also had people struggling uh, for a variety of economic reasons, primarily brought upon them by the pandemic. So we put money in their pockets. Uh, so we have one of the fastest growing economies. We have one of the fast, lowest uh, unemployment rates uh, in the world. Uh, we have a uh, country that is doing well. The gentleman mentioned the stock market declining. It did. Why did it decline? Because we have the pandemic. Uh, uh, we, and, and inflation resulted from that. And the Federal Reserve, as was true under Ronald Reagan when unemployment went to uh, 10 point five six seven eight percent uh, because Paul Volcker was slowing down the economy to un to defeat inflation inflation is harmful particularly to people who are elderly and on fixed uh, incomes so I want the gentleman to know that we empathize with that and therefore we're distressed uh, when we pass a bill 
the Inflation Reduction Act that not a single Republican voted for. And there is absolutely no denial of the reality that's going to bring Americans' costs down. Not only that, it kept 13 million people who were going to fall off insurance on the Affordable Care Act, which I know the gentleman's party does not support, but 13 million Americans who had health care insurance as a result of the, uh, the American Rescue Plan, but it was going to stop on December 31st. We, we continued that. Uh, we put on uh, legislation that would uh, bring down prescription drug costs and allow companies to uh, sell drugs and to Medicare in a negotiated way. We negotiate, as the gentleman knows, and I, I, I don't know whether the gentleman thinks that policy ought to be stopped, but we negotiate for prices uh, with veterans' uh, health care. And now we're going to do it for Medicare. We wanted to do it for everybody, but the Senate Republicans would, would not agree to that. Uh, we believe that the, the infrastructure bill uh, going to really help bring down inflation, create jobs, expand our economy. We believe the Chips and Science Bill is going to do the same. Um, only 13 of your side voted for the infrastructure bill, uh, which was, I think, a bill that would have helped uh, inflation by making supplies better. Uh, the energy portion of the Inflation Reduction Act uh, is going to bring down the cost of energy. It's going to create comp competition on energy, and it's also going to fight climate change. I lament the fact that not a single Republican voted for the Infl Inflation Reduction Act, even if you reject the fact that it's going to reduce inflation, as I think you probably do. I don't, I don't want to anticipate what you do, but that's my guess. Uh, but there are literally scores of economists <coughs> who believe it is going to bring down inflation. As importantly, <coughs> the committee uh, who looks closely <coughs> at the, I'm just really choking me up with this speech. <laughs> so is this inflation. Get some water. <coughs> Say it's going to bring it down. And the Committee for a Responsible Budget says they believe it's going to bring down inflation. Uh, I don't want to predict that it's going to bring it down half a point, a point, two points, three points, four points. I hope it does. But I think it was certainly worth a try, and none of your colleagues, either in this House or in the Senate uh, down the aisle, uh, gave it a chance. We passed it anyway, because under a process, obviously, that allows just uh, uh, Democrats in the Senate to pass something under a process called reconciliation. So uh, I, I want to tell the gentleman that I have apprised the committee chairman of the bills that you've talked to me about. And uh, I've asked them to look at them. Uh, frankly, I cannot tell you I've gotten a response from each one of them. Uh, but uh, uh, we, we are uh, giving them attention. Uh, obviously, uh, we, we want to know what our committees think about not only your legislation, our legislation, uh, and our legislation. That is co uh, uh, bipartisan legislation. And, but uh, we lament the fact, I will tell you very frankly, uh, Mr. Speaker, we lament the fact that our Republican colleagues in, in all four of the bills I've just mentioned, which are designed to grow the economy, the CHIPS bill, the bipartisan, 19 senators voted for the uh, uh, infrastructure bill and help put it together with President Biden and Senate Democrats. Uh, lamentably, only 13 of your colleagues chose to uh, vote for it. I'm glad they did, but it was over the advice and counsel of uh, uh, their leadership. Uh, that bill clearly was embraced by the American people and incorporated policies essentially that President Trump said in 2016 he was going to recommend and have the Congress adopt. Uh, it didn't happen in 17, didn't happen in 18, didn't happen in 19, didn't happen in 20. So I say to my friend, 
we think all four of those bills are going to have a very positive impact on our economy, on growing our economy, and ensuring supply sides, ensuring supplies of basic goods, and bringing down inflation. I thank the gentleman for yielding. I thank the gentleman, and obviously a lot of different bills the gentleman mentioned, each one of them, by the way, uh, when you rack them up, adds up to trillions of dollars in new spending. And if trillions in Washington spending were going to solve the problem, then we would have no inflation. Obviously, it's going the opposite direction, and it is going the opposite direction because of the trillions of dollars in new spending. Well, my, and if you well, go my, down the line, and, and obviously as the gentleman went through all of those things, I'd like to respond to a number of them because it just doesn't mesh with the realities of where our economy is today. And, and if you look at the numbers, you know, we could talk about other countries. And, and other countries have passed bad policies that have wrecked their economies. You can see Europe right now finally having a renewed debate on energy policy because they passed some really foolish energy policies that are destroying their energy economies, making them more dependent on Russia, for example, to get their oil, to get their natural gas, and they're finally waking up. A lot of them shut their nuclear plants down, which is safe, sound, renewable energy, and they wrecked their economies. And so they're starting to reverse that. And I'm glad they're finally waking up and reversing course. It seems like right here in Washington, the failed policies that President Biden has put in place, they want to double down on. And so when you look at the results of it, that's why we get where we are, double-digit increases in food costs that families are facing. Electricity costs over 15 percent higher just over last year, and it's about to get worse because the bill that the president what? was celebrating at the White House had another increase in taxes well, the on natural me. gas, which I will can't. raise those costs even higher. And I'll, I'll yield to the gentleman. I, well, in a I moment. can't see the I can't see the chart. Could he read? I'll be tell me what it says. You. So I don't know what he's talking about. So electricity rates, 15 percent, 15.8 percent higher than last year. Here. Food at home, they're in America. Here. This is all in okay. America. Families that we represent are facing the burden of all of these policies that started in Washington that are ultimately ending up taking money out of their pockets. And so when you go to the grocery store, if you can afford to get there, if you can afford to or find the food on the shelves, it's 13 and percent higher. And we've seen the list, whether it's eggs, dairy products, bacon, some of them 30 percent higher individually but it adds up to about 13.5% more that you're paying at the grocery store. Mortgage rates, if somebody's trying to become a first-time home buyer, which is part of the American dream, today it's 110% higher to get a mortgage than it was a year ago. And most economists, including many Democrat economists, point directly to the trillions in spending in Washington as the reason for that. And families have figured this out and said, stop the madness. And yet, again, at the White House, in, a, in the most tone-deaf thing I've seen in, in a while, uh, the president is having a party celebrating a $730 billion increase in taxes and spending at the exact same time that the market is tanking because of the inflation created by all this spending. And to finish it up, transportation costs 11.3 percent higher. That's what's happening in America. And again, Europe did a lot of these same bad policies, and they figured it out, and they're starting to reverse course. They just got rid of their prime minister in England because of what they did to wreck their energy economy. And so we brought bills, and, and as I shared with the gentleman over months, we've brought a number of bills forward that would solve these problems, and not one of them has been scheduled for a vote on the House floor. And so we want to address this problem. We don't just sit back and go, well, it's happening in other countries, so let it stay racking up here in America, it doesn't need to. These are all unforced errors that are the result of failed policies. And instead of stopping the failed policies, working with Republicans to turn it around and lower these costs, it seems like there's a desire to just double down and talk about trillions more to spend. If spending was solving the problems, then we would have none of these problems. The problems have gotten worse with each multi-trillion or multi-hundred billion dollar package of legislation that's come out of this body. And at some point, I would hope the other side would look and recognize, okay, forget about Europe and Asia. They need to look in the mirror and say, why did they create some of their problems? We can do something about these problems. And we brought those ideas forward. And every single time we've been told no, which must mean that this is okay, because this is not okay to us. And there's a way to reverse it. 
And if just spending more money and having parties at the White House to celebrate that spending while Rome is burning is where we're going to be, I think there's going to be a day of reckoning on that. I don't think the country is comfortable with where we are and when the idea is just to keep spending more money and act like if maybe it's another five trillion, what's the number that's going to finally get us out of this mess? If it was trillions, we'd be there already. Maybe just maybe we need to look at going the other way. Stop paying people not to work, for example, when everybody is looking for workers. Unfortunately, the IRS is now looking for 87,000 more people, and as CBO just confirmed, a lot of that is going to be going after hardworking families, families making under 400,000 a year, even mm -hmm. though we were promised on this floor that wouldn't happen. We brought an amendment, by the way, to ensure that President Biden's promise would be upheld. We brought an amendment that would say and ensure no American paying under $400,000 would see their taxes go up with these 87,000 new IRS agents. The majority rejected that amendment, and literally the day of the vote, the Congressional Budget Office came out and confirmed it's over $20 billion in new taxes. That bill is going to cost families making less than $400,000. And those families are already struggling. They'd love to save up and buy a new house. They can't even afford to get to the grocery store to pay 13.5% more. And if they try to go get a mortgage today, they're going to be paying more than double for that mortgage than they were a year ago. At some point, we've got to stop these failed policies that are causing these problems. Go look at what some of these other countries are doing to finally reverse course, because they are, and they need to, but so do we. And I would hope that we would bring some of those bills to the House floor, because we could start reversing these horrible trends right now, and I would yield. I thank the gentleman for yielding. First, let me say, uh, the gentleman dismisses what other countries are doing, or he says they're doing bad things and therefore they have inflation. Every country has inflation. Why? Because the pandemic shut down the world. It shut down the markets. It shut uh, production of supplies. That's why. Uh, people had to stay home. They weren't out producing and making things. Uh, uh, we kept a lot of people employed. We spent trillions of dollars doing it, uh, which was, were bipartisan bills signed by Donald Trump. Trillions. And then as soon as Donald Trump left, all of a sudden, uh, the other party, his party, decided, the Trump party decided, it's over. It wasn't over for the American people. Kids were not in schools. Kid, people hadn't been uh, given shots in arms yet. And uh, people were really hurting. And those 48 percent of the children in poverty were still in poverty. But it was over. No more bipartisanship. It's another president, so we're going to blame him. That's politics over people. What we did was people over politics, because we knew people were hurting. And so we passed legislation to give them help. And every Republican, every Republican, Mr. Speaker, voted no. We voted to help them get shots in arms. Every Republican voted no. We voted to get their kids back in school, to make their schools safe and, and, and healthy. Every Republican voted no, because they wanted to bleat about inflation. And the reason they don't like these figures that I've just said, because these are the economic successful nations of the world, many of whom have inflation higher than we. The gentleman is absolutely right. We need to get inflation down. A hundred and twenty-six economists say that the Inflation Reduction Act will reduce inflation, reduce health care costs, and reduce energy costs. Now, the gentleman and I have had this discussion about his energy bills, which he thinks will be the salvation. They always think, drill more, life better. I get it. Louisiana uh, is a state that wants to drill. I get that. We use that product. It's an important product. We're going to continue to use it. So I have no criticism of that. 
But in the last bill that we passed, which is really going to fight the climate uh, challenge that we face, four 1,000-year floods in four different communities in America within 30 days of one another. The West is on fire, literally and figuratively. Climate challenge is real. Every Republican voted no to invest in meeting that challenge head on. Every Republican, House and Senate, Mr. Speaker. So when I, I can't read the chart, but the 13 percent, inflation is too high. I go to the grocery store almost every weekend. I live alone. I don't buy a lot of food at any one time because I'm traveling a lot and here a lot. Don't want it to go bad. So I get it on prices. I get it on gasoline prices. They're tough. And that's why we passed a food and uh, fuel bill. The gentleman from Louisiana voted no. The leader of the uh, Republican Party, Mr. McCarthy, in the House voted no. And the overwhelming majority of Republicans voted no. <laughs> that wanted to make sure that we had competition. That's the free market system. That's what brings prices down. If you have a monopoly, you can charge anything you want if people need the product. Now, I won't go through the statistics because the statistics are we're producing more energy today than we produced two years ago. I, I read those statistics. I'm not going to bore the gentleman, Mr. Speaker, with them again. They don't bore me because it shows that when the argument is the reason we have is in inflation is because not, we're not producing energy. The reason we don't have as much energy is because companies made a rational decision. What was that rational decision? In March and April of 2020, people started <laughs> staying in their homes. They stopped buying gas and other products, petroleum products. And as a result, corporations made a reasonable judgment. We're not going to produce more capacity. And so uh, when we got out of uh, the uh, inflation, we're still not doing that. But we are doing more than we did some years ago, as those statistics that I read to the gentleman uh, three or four times, so I won't read them again. Um, but the industry, as I've also told the gentleman, owns 9,000 unused approved permits to drill onshore, 37 million acres offshore, which can be permitted, ready to go. So uh, when you simply ignore and pretend that somehow Joe Biden, President of the United States, is responsible for worldwide inflation, and dismiss the pandemic. I don't think I've heard one time, Mr. Speaker, the Republican whip mention the pandemic as a cause of the inflation. It's all about energy. And I beg to differ with the gentleman, Mr. Speaker. I think, honestly, the American people need to know that. And yes, the stock market had a rough tumble. Why did it have a rough tumble? Because the Federal Reserve the chairman of which was appointed by President Trump, responsibly, along with his board of governors, responded to try to get this inflation under control and bring it down. I don't know whether the gentleman supports that action or not. Ronald Reagan supported that action, uh, although he did not appoint the chairman of the Federal Reserve that did it. Uh, so, Mr. Chairman, we're going to continue to fight for the people and put them above our politics or even our own personal economic interests by passing the American Rescue Plan, by passing the bipartisan infrastructure bill, by 
making sure that America can be seen as a country that makes it in America. Chips, investing in science for the future, for the people. And yes, the Inflation Reduction Act, uh, which uh, the, the gentleman and his party has misrepresented over and over and over again with something they know is not the truth. They project 80,000 new people going after average Americans. They know that's not true, Mr. Speaker. After years of trying to defund the people who collect the revenues from our people so everybody pays their fair share, And those of us, and I say of us, who are doing well, pay our fair share, and the people who make billions, who pay less of a percentage in many respects, as Warren Buffett said, than those who work for them. Yes, we want taxes fairly enforced, Mr. Speaker. We won't want anybody paying an unfair share because somebody is not paying at all. The IRS will have, after those 10 years of uh, accretion of employees, have as many as employees as it had uh, back in the 1990s, trying to make sure it can, in fact, enforce a fair system that provides the revenues that the federal government needs to protect, preserve our people's welfare, economy, and national security. I yield back. Well, thank the gentleman. Uh, first, to clarify, it wasn't me who said that the IRS agents, this new army of 87,000 IRS agents, would be going after people to collect $20 billion more in taxes who were making less than $400,000. It was the Congressional Budget Office who put in their report the day of the vote, that that is exactly what would happen, is that those IRS agents would, in fact, be going after people making less than 400000 to the tune of $20 billion in new taxes. We brought an amendment to stop that from happening, to say they can't go after those people making less than 400000 which is what the President promised in the Congressional Budget Office report was right there, saying $20 billion is what they would pay in new taxes and the majority rejected the amendment. So clearly the intention was to have those IRS agents go after them. Again, those weren't my numbers. That was the Congressional Budget Office. If there's a dispute the gentleman has, take it up with them. But they were the ones who came out with that report the day of the vote. Maybe that was why the bill was rushed through, but we pointed that out, and no one disputed that the Congressional Budget Office put those numbers out there. But the president still kept saying, don't worry, they're not gonna go after them, not a dime. But CBO said, $20 billion in new taxes those lower and middle income families will pay. We tried to stop it. The majority rejected it. Now, to go to the oil and gas comments the, pres the, the gentleman made about President Biden, you would think, listening to your comments, that Joe Biden was John D. Rockefeller, and he's drilling everywhere. Well, let's first no, I don't think I've made that comment. Uh, well, I and, and, and the gentleman, I won't say the gentleman did, but as the gentleman talked about all this production and drilling that's going on and all this oil that's coming out, it was Joe Biden who said, quote, as a candidate, no more drilling on federal lands, no more drilling, including offshore, no ability for the oil industry to continue to drill, period, ends. And then he carried out policies to back that up and stop drilling. We've pointed out many times major companies in America that want to increase production as the gentleman did say, that they're not increasing production. They tried, and they've been rejected on the permits they would need. You can't just go drill a new hole tomorrow. Every well ultimately depletes. We all know that. That's been going on since man invented the ability to drill for oil in the world. And so as oil depletes, you need to get new permits to go into those areas. And the Biden administration over and over again rejected those new permits. So there's leases out there. And again, a lease might be like you have a car. You got a car in your driveway. Well, if you don't have an engine in the car, the car's not functional. If you have a lease, the lease doesn't do you any good if you can't get the permits to build pipelines. We've talked about the pipeline problems. 
as this administration over and over again has blocked new pipelines. How do you move the oil? How do you get the permit to go and explore for more? And so what the president did, again, if, if we were just maxed out on drilling here, why did the president get on Air Force One and fly 5,700 miles to Saudi Arabia to beg them to produce more oil? They said no, because they don't have the ability over there. The president called Vladimir Putin and asked him to drill for more oil. Putin said no. You don't need to ask those countries to produce more oil, because we have it here, but there's documented evidence over and over where this administration has said no to permits, no to the ability for us to produce more of our own energy. And so what happens? The price goes up. They're talking about, during this winter, the inability for people to have home heating oil. And so they're importing it from countries like Russia because they're not allowing more production here where companies are trying to produce more and being turned down by this administration. The secretary, I think it was the secretary of energy, when asked, what's your plan to produce more in America? She started laughing. It's not a laughing matter, but that's been the attitude of this administration. And then to finish up on the point where the gentleman started talking about all these bills that we voted against, starting with the $1.9 trillion spending bill that this administration came right out the box with. As the economy was starting to turn around and people were starting to bring workers back, trying to get workers back, a $1.9 trillion package of bills came forward to pay people in part not to work, to stay at home, made it harder for people to get workers back. But what it also did, and this is something we brought up during the debate, checks were being sent to people. Well, we pointed out that checks were going to end up going to people in prisons. And we were told that wasn't going to happen. Just like with the 87,000 IRS agents when CBO debunked that, don't worry, nobody in prison is going to get checks. Turned out later the Boston bomber got a check. Who knows how many billions of dollars went to prisoners to be paid. I mean, we're already, taxpayers are already paying for them to, to be housed, to be fed, to get health care. But then they also got checks, actual checks and stimulus money. We had an amendment to stop that from happening. But ultimately, yes, we voted against those things because we wanted to see our economy back open. And when there was this idea that everybody had to stay home, that wasn't the case when we started last year. In fact, many states started to open again. There were some states that stayed shut down. And by the way, you can see a massive movement around the country where New York State alone lost about a million people who moved to states like Florida because they didn't want to be shut down anymore when there was a state that was open following safety protocols, protecting their people, but allowing people to live in freedom again and live their lives. And so people moved out of states, the shutdown states like California, New York, and moved to states that were open. You can see the numbers, and they're dramatic numbers. So not every state handled it the same, but the states that opened were having a lot more success in protecting their people at the same time, but the states that stayed closed had devastating consequences. Not to mention what we saw with, with children being shut out of school, the learning that wasn't happening, and those are devastating numbers we're seeing today because this administration changed the science, and that is documented, changed the science over at CDC to cater to the unions who wanted to keep schools shut down. And so millions of kids didn't learn at the levels they should have, and those numbers are still showing up today that those kids were, were left behind, lost a year, two years, they will never get back because other kids were in school learning when the unions wanted to work with the Biden administration to keep schools shut down. And so those are the things that we tried to address. None of those bills were allowed to come to the floor, but that's where we are, and I would yield. I thank the gentleman for yielding. First of all, to your last statement. The unions. What were the unions trying to do? They were trying to keep teachers uh, healthy. They were trying to keep kids healthy. Because we were telling people, don't congregate. Don't get all together. They were trying to keep kids out of school whose HVAC systems, heating, ventilating systems, were not up to date and couldn't transfer the air in a cleanly, clean, healthy way. So we gave them billions of dollars. Yes, we spent a lot of money to make our people safe, to get people back to work, to get kids back in school, and it worked. They're back in school. None of us are wearing a mask. 
We congregate now. We all get together. Hardly anybody, if anybody. Some people who are, have particular vulnerabilities wearing masks, God bless them. It worked. And Republicans voted no. I want to go to this energy issue because there are Johnny One Note. Inflation is caused by administration policy on inflation. Uh, on gas pr prices and, and, spend. and uh, natural energy, not natural, energy production, natural. Excuse me for stumbling on that, but the fact of the matter is he ignores inflation is happening in a lot of places. I will tell you, in Denmark, they're pretty energy independent with renewable energies, not relying on supply chains per se. Their inflation is higher than ours because it was a global phenomenon. Their economies were assaulted. Ours came back faster and better. Why? Because we invested in our people. Now, let me go to a fact. This is just a simple fact. The U.S. Energy Information Administration. Production, average production. That means over four years for Trump. Average production for Donald Trump, 10,968,000 barrels per day. For Joe Biden, 11,185 million barrels a day. That's more, not less, than the average under Donald Trump. But it serves their political interests, Mr. Speaker, to somehow project to the American people uh, that Biden has shut down the energy industry, which is why you're paying more. I explained that the energy companies did, in fact, cut production. It was a rational business judgment. People were driving less and buying less petroleum. They're still concerned. And lot, most of them are seeing that there's going to be an alternative energy that is going to be required if we're going to make sure that this globe does not burn up with the people with it. He also says that CBO, I don't have the report in front of me, so I'm going to wing it. But no one under $400,000 got a tax increase as a result of the bill the gentleman uh, alludes to. And if CBO says, and I'll read the report, that $20 billion is going to be received from that category, It will be because somebody, whether they're making 100, 200, 300, 400 thousand dollars, is not paying their fair share pursuant to laws that we adopt. Not because we put new taxes on them, but because they're not paying the taxes that are due. Now, I don't have the CBO report in, in front of me, so I'm uh, opining, because it certainly wasn't because uh, we had. We have new enforcement officers. Unless those enforcement officers find that the people to which the gentleman uh, refers are not paying their fair share. And by the way, it will also apply to the people who are making billions and not paying any taxes, much less their fair share. Let me repeat that energy figure together because I think he'll probably go back to energy because that's what we do almost every colloquy. More energy is being produced under Joe Biden than was produced under Donald Trump. I yield back. Well, thank the gentleman. If, if Joe Biden wants to keep producing more energy, we're giving him opportunities, but he says no. He said no many, many times, and he but, campaigned on that. But we would continue to push to bring those bills to the floor. We're gonna continue to push to bring bills to the floor to solve a lot of these problems that we have identified and we have bills to address them. And if with the majority doesn't want to bring them up, understand that's the prerogative of the majority, but we're going to still keep talking about them. We're going to still keep pushing 
every opportunity we can to bring down inflation, to lower energy costs, to address so many of these other problems that people are still facing today. If that uh, single mom who's working as a waitress two shifts uh, is going to be audited by some new IRS agent who is tasked under the terms that we saw with going out and generating that money. Uh, if the result of that is that she has to pay more money, it doesn't mean she's cheating on her taxes. If all of a sudden an auditor's coming after you, who knows what kind of pressure they're putting. But it's 87,000 more IRS agents tasked with going and generating not 20 billion, it's the 20 billion is just for the people making under 400,000. It's over 250 billion that some of the numbers show that they have to generate, meaning they're gonna have to go out and find that from taxpayers. That doesn't mean every one of those people they audit is a tax cheat. It just means that person's gonna now face an audit who otherwise is working two or three shifts to meet the demands of these high, higher costs that they're facing because of inflation. So we're going to continue fighting for those hardworking families, fighting to lower the burden on this government, take some of that heat off so they can spend more time at home with their family, not working two or three shifts or worrying about the next audit they're going to face from a new IRS agent who's told to go generate more money. Hopefully we can address that. We'll continue to push for that. But I would yield. I thank the gentleman for yielding. I, mean, I think we're probably pretty close to closing. And I would say this, Mr. Speaker. I think the American people are in the process of making a judgment. On our side, we see things as pretty positive in terms of the response to the policies that we've been adopting without any significant help from our Republican colleagues. But they'll have a chance to vote and decide. Uh, we have passed legislation, as we said we would do, for the people. Not for the sake of politics, but for the sake of children, families, young and old, and yes, even rich and poor. Now, I do want to comment because I would urge my Republican friends to be precise in their conversations with the American public. There are not 80,000 revenue auditors or agents uh, included uh, in this bill that we talked about uh, on bringing inflation down, which economists say will bring inflation down. And our Republican friends say they want to do that. But they vote against bills that will bring down demonstrably and without possibility of denial, costs for people, health costs for people, prescription drug costs for people, insulin, which costs about less in single figures. And we capped it at 35. That's about 400 percent profit. But they're now paying 300 or 400 or 500. Now, luckily, because we could pass it with Democrats, seniors won't be paying that. They'll be capped at 35. But millions of other Americans, because the Republicans would not support it in the United States Senate, we passed it here, will not get the benefit of that cap. And they will paying, be paying far above justifiable prices for insulin. We're producing energy. The argument is specious that somehow this inflation is caused by us cutting back on energy supply when I just read a figure subject to dispute. Maybe next week I'll hear, no, that figure is wrong. Maybe. Producing more energy than Trump did. Not Trump himself, but the country during Trump's presidency. I would really urge, Mr. Speaker, my Republican friends, tell the American people the truth. Yes, there are some more agents, because there are people not paying their fair share. And if you have an audit and they say you're not paying a fair share and you pay more, isn't that 
what we expect when we pass tax bills that people will pay pursuant to what uh, the law says, whether they make 100,000 or 100 million or 100 billion. I don't guess anybody makes 100 billion in a year. We ought to be honest with the American people. Give them the facts, and then they'll make a decision. But tell them the truth. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I yield back. Thank the gentleman. We will continue to be honest with the American people. It was the administration that used the 87,000 number. If that number should be lower, I'd love to hear what that number well, the would gentleman be. Yield so I I'd can yield. And if the gentleman, the gentleman has a number, please tell me, because that's what we heard I, I from thank the, the administration. Gentleman. There are 80,000 plus uh, additional, which will get back to 20 years ago level of employment in the IRS. We, the IRS has been reduced in personnel in all categories, not just enforcement agents, but in all categories, which will undermine their ability to serve the public and collect taxes so that we all pay our fair share. And so people who don't have accountants, who don't have ways and means to avoid taxes, uh, are treated fairly themselves. Everybody ought to be treated fairly. And if we don't think they're being treated fairly because of the law, we ought to change the law. But we ought to tell the American people the truth. There are not that many enforcement agents. They are in so many different categories in the IRS to make sure that the IRS can successfully do its job and answer people's questions about what, when, where, why, they have to do things pursuant to law. That's what I meant. Not that the 80,000 people are enforcement agents. They are not. They are not. Far lower number than that. But we know that they're over, over 100 billion. I think it's a much larger figure than that. Over $100 billion in taxes that are owed under the law that are not being paid which means that uh, the tax rates need to be higher on others than they ought to be. That's what this bill gets at. It was the, the, this bill, uh, the Inflation Reduction Bill, as well as reducing inflation. Uh, I'm sorry that my Republican friends made a determination it was not a bill they could support uh, to help bring down inflation, but that was the judgment they made. I think they want to bring down inflation. We want to bring down inflation. Uh, but uh, when we present a bill to the floor which does it, we would hope we would get support on a bipartisan basis, and I yield back. Thank the gentleman. We will continue to tell the truth about these policies. Clearly, there's a disagreement on many of them, but that's why we have this debate. Look forward to continuing it with the gentleman. With that, Mr. Speaker, happy to yield back.